uh, Minister Naftali Bennett, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I very much uh, appreciate this uh, unique opportunity to um, hear you and to speak with you. Uh, yeah, so Israel's always in elections. This is our fourth election in, in two years. Uh, I don't recommend it. I, I think uh, the, the very calm American uh, po political scene is, uh, is uh, preferential. Um, but anyway, we're, we're here also uh, tackling and uh, corona, the coronavirus, uh, um, the way you guys are, though things are different. What I'd like to do over the past, uh, the next few minutes is, um, you know, tell you what's going on here in Israel in terms of the battle against COVID, in terms of uh, how I view the new relationship uh, with uh, uh, the Biden administration, what are the few key challenges, and then certainly I'll, I'll be happy uh, to take questions. So um, Israel's response and uh, course of action vis-a-vis -vis COVID is uh, very interesting. On the one hand, we're number one in the world in uh, uh, deploying the vaccinations, which is, is uh, wonderful. On the other hand, to be very honest, uh, we're uh, the degree of incompetence in managing the, the COVID crisis here in Israel is, uh, is pretty much unbelievable. Um, in the first round, the first wave of COVID, I served as defense minister. Uh, those were good times, I have to say. Uh, the, the government was very competent. We closed the borders quickly. Uh, I formed uh, the first uh, COVID hotels here, uh, among the first in the world. We ramped up fairly quick, quickly on the testing, um, took care of, of the Haredi society, the Arab society. Uh, things worked and, and we, we got over the first wave uh, uh, fairly well with very low numbers uh, of, um, of deaths and uh, fairly low impact on the economy. Uh, then uh, Bibi decided uh, that uh, we will not be part of his government, uh, which is a legitimate uh, choice. Uh, at that point, the new uh, dysfunctional government, the Bibi Gantz government was formed. These two folks um, could not get along. The entire government, this certainly has been the most dysfunctional government in Israel's history. Now, you know, with you, I feel that we're in family, so I'm, I'm being very candid. Um, they dropped the ball in the uh, um, months of May, June, July, uh, when we had the hiatus in, uh, in, uh, of uh, COVID. That was precisely the period where we ought to have ramped up on, uh, on the uh, tracing, testing, uh, and isolation efforts, and nothing was done. We finished the first wave at the very, and, and nothing was progressed through those three crucial months that we could have prepared. Uh, moreover, the uh, Ben Gurion Airport, from the very beginning to till very recently, there were absolutely no tests done for anyone coming from abroad. Nothing, uh, no requirement for testing before boarding the airport. You know, 72 hours. No testing upon landing. Nothing. So essentially the government, you know, took a hose and massively imported all the variants, all the mutations, all the crud the world created over the past half year directly into Israel. So we very rapidly became uh, uh, among the, the, the uh, nations that have the highest percentage of the British mutation. Right now, by and large, almost all new cases, and there's a, a big amount of cases, are of the British mutation. So, but on the other hand, uh, uh, BB was very rapid and, and quick on, on uh, acquiring the vaccinations. I think that was a good move. But here's the thing, you cannot uh, uh, solely build the entire strategy on vaccinations, on medicine, which, there's more unknown than known. We do know today that the Pfizer vaccination works. It works both in reducing severe symptoms uh, for those who are infected, and it apparently 
has a, a meaningful effect, albeit we don't know exactly how much, in reducing infections, on uh, uh, getting infected and infecting on. But when you have a massive vaccination effort on the public, which is ha has very high infection rates, it means essentially that you're vaccinating lots of people who are currently infected and you don't know that. And that turns Israel into the battle between the vaccinations and the virus, which means that there's a, a tremendous evolutionary pressure to create a unique Israeli mutation. I would not be surprised if a day from now, a week from now, or a month from now, because so many Israelis that are infected are getting the vaccines and, and don't know it because they're asymptomatic, uh, the, 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 there's, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't bet on, on, on the fact that these vaccinations will, will work forever. And now we're sort of ending the third national uh, shutdown. Uh, Israel is among the highest rates in the world of infection, um, among the top quarter, 25% of deaths per capita. Um, it's the very number one in the world in terms of days of national shutdown on education and on uh, business. So it's not looking good, but the vaccinations at the same time currently are working. So it's it's a sort of a people all around the world are looking at Israel and, and asking how can it be that we have such a advanced uh, vaccination program while at the same time the infection rates are not decreasing. It's because everything but the vaccinations uh, was grossly mismanaged. Uh, my approach, I, I sort of became uh, uh, Mr. COVID in, in round one. I was the guy who initiated uh, protecting the elderly. You might recall, you know, take care of grandma and grandpa is how we called it. And, you know, the, the, the hotels, the testing, all of that. My approach now is that the only way to have a, a viable ongoing uh, uh, strategy to deal with corona is to eliminate corona. And it's easier than one would expect. I don't believe in these national lockdowns. There's a, a tremendous degree of fatigue. People are tired, people are fed up, and there's no hope. So essentially my plan, I came out with my third plan this year. Um, first one was back in March, second one was in June. And now the new plan, which is to eradicate uh, COVID from Israel, it's not that difficult. You just need to control the borders well, let people in, but not let the uh, the virus in by by doing a triple testing and, and other elements. And secondly, instead of focus on uh, highly infected areas, go the other way. Start cleaning up. You know, sometimes you, when I was a kid in Haifa, my mom cleaned for Passover for Pesach, so she would clean one room. And then that was off limits. You could not enter that room with chametz. And then another room. So you, you have a, a sterile area, sterile area, and you increase it uh, while forbidding people from uh, uh, infected areas to enter the clean areas. Within clean areas, you have massive ongoing testing, ongoing, you sort of comb the area and declare it clean. Um, this plan is gaining traction in Israel. Typically over the past uh, eight years, there's a bunch of stuff that I, I was the first to, to put on the table and took time. You know, the sovereignty plan from 2011 was ridiculed upon and just a year ago, it sort of became almost official policy. So I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced this will become policy. And the only question I have is how many more Israelis will die until it becomes a uh, policy and how many businesses will fold. So that's my approach. If, if anyone wants uh, um, to elaborate, I could do that later on. In terms of the new uh, government, the new administration, uh, first of all, we certainly congratulate uh, President Biden on becoming the 46th president of the United States. And, and um, you know, 
nothing changes in terms of, of the fact that these are two nations um, that, that shared, you know, the very, very deepest uh, core values. Um, one of the issues that we see eye to eye is the ICC, the International Court, and uh, I appreciate the Biden administration uh, reacting to this news by saying uh, that it has uh, uh, serious concerns. I will say this on the ICC. Uh, for me, this is personal. The ICC is personal. I lost friends in battle because Israel was too cautious on fighting uh, terrorists who want to kill us in order to save uh, lives of uh, civilians on the other side. Yes, it is personal. Uh, Fatu bin Suda, let me be very clear. No fake court will ever stop me from defending my four children, Yoni, Michal, Avigail, and David. Never will we allow anyone to tie the hands of the IDF soldiers. The days that Jews are attacked without response are over. And certainly we're not going to have any of this uh, from the European continent. When Hamas shoots at my family from within residential homes, from within hospitals, from within schools, and I saw this in my own eyes and with Hezbollah and with Hamas, they are held responsible for the deaths of their own people. They are murdering their people, not Israel. So there's good and bad. There's no moral equivalent between Hamas who's attacking us or Hezbollah who's attacking us and us who are defending. Uh, we're gonna need a lot of help here. Uh, we're fighting a just battle. This is uh, uh, simply a farce and we're not gonna let this uh, happen. Um, never tie the hands of Israeli soldiers. And I'm not gonna be silent in the face of uh, this outrage. In terms of uh, Iran, well, certainly the immediate and uh, very, very important issue for the months ahead is uh, Iran's nuclear pro program. I'm happy to hear President Biden saying that the US won't lift sanctions on Iran in exchange for Iran returning to the negotiation table. It's a good position, but we need to go further. We need to bury the fantasy that the nuclear deal of 2015 can stop Iran from going nuclear. Uh, listen to what uh, the chief of staff, Aviv Kohavi, uh, said a couple of weeks ago. He said, and I quote, returning to the 2015 nuclear agreements or even to an agreement that is similar but with only few improvements is a bad thing and it's not the right thing to do. I know Chief of Staff Kuchavi very well. Um, he's a good man, he's a decent man. He's not a political man. All he cares about profoundly is the security of the people of Israel. And his professional assessment about the Iranian deal is precisely correct. Now, people say that the deal restricts Iran's nuclear program, but here's the thing. The very restrictions in the deal that limit Iran's enrichment capabilities and reduce the time that Iran would need to build a bomb, well, they expire. These restric restrictions expire, and that's why it's called sunset clause. They go dark, and if they go dark, the whole region will go dark. If Iran keeps the deal, it would eventually have the ability to produce enough highly enriched uranium for dozens of nuclear bombs. And I wanna be clear, the deal, the 2015 deal gave Iran the ability to reach the nuclear goal line in exchange for a promise that it wouldn't cross into the end zone. That's a crazy deal. It means we allow them to get to the you know, very red line, and then it's only up to them within days to cross that line. And you know that Iran recently decided to uh, um, accelerate the enriching uh, the uranium in enrichment to higher levels, and uh, it doesn't take a long time for that to happen. 
So that's why we need the, the New Deal to focus on A, ridding the sunset clauses, B, uh, having effective uh, supervision on all the elements, C, cover the weaponization program, which is not covered, and finally, uh, restrain Iran from its regional aggression. This is crazy. We've got, I wouldn't say a superpower, but a regional power that wakes up in the morning and asks itself, how can we kill people? How can we create havoc? It's crazy. It's crazy that this is legitimate. I mean, if Israel woke up in the morning and started uh, uh, pushing for terror across Europe or you know, anywhere, we'd be rightly condemned. This is crazy and, and it's illegitimate. And the truth is that with or without nuclear weapons, Iran is a menace to the world, just like the Soviet Union was for many decades. It's uh, the very essence of this regime, regime is dangerous, it's evil. Recently read the speeches of Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the original revolution. You should read his speeches because it's all there. It's all in the book. His desire to spread Islamic radicalism worldwide. The primary aim of the Republic is aggression, domination. It's uh, lifeblood is cruelty. So we need to deal with this very regime. You know that this regime internally has been doing horrible things. You know, I, I wonder if any of you know who Navid Afkari is. He was a Iranian wrestler. In 2018, Afkari participated in a peaceful demonstration against the regime in Iran. Afterwards, he was arrested, charged with murder, tortured. He gave a confession to a crime that he did not commit. Last September, Afkari was executed. He was 27 years old. Last month, Iran executed another wrestler, Mehdi Ali Husseini, under very similar circumstances. Why on earth would any government execute athletes of its own nation? Because th this regime is afraid of its own people. And I think we, we, Israel and the Jewish community in the United States, should not be silent. You know, I, we all know how much Malcolm and the Conference of Presidents participated in, in the battle to free the Jews of, of the Soviet Union. You demanded change. And here also we need change. It's time that the whole world knows the name Navid Afkari, just like the world knew the name Natan Sharansky. The way Iran treats its own people is not a secondary issue. Certainly with a new administration, when we're talking about human rights, this goes to the very core of American and any free nation's values. There will never be peace in the Middle East when we have this regime, this evil regime, fighting against its own people and against everyone else. The way I view Iran is as a regional octopus sending its arms to envelope Israel and Israel's mistake, in my point of view, for many decades, we fought the tip of the, of the hands of this octopus. Uh, Hezbollah being the tip of the hands in Lebanon, Hamas being the tip of the hands in Gaza. In Syria, they don't send their own soldiers. Turns out Iranians do not like dying. Oh, but it's so ever convenient for them to send others to die for causes they don't even know. So the message is, in my strategy as hopefully future prime minister, is to focus on the head of the octopus. No more immunity for ayatollahs who send others a thousand kilometers away to fight with our boys here. So when we fight on the Lebanese border, we're not fighting Hezbollah, we're fighting Iran but they're not paying any price. So they will begin paying a price. And I think uh, anyone who's seen what's going on starting my period as defense minister saw that things can happen in Iran when Iran tries to 
make us pay a, a price. So bottom line, our priorities right now, we need to eliminate the, the coronavirus. We need to free up the Israeli economy. If and when I become prime minister, I'm just gonna clean up the crazy bureaucracy and regulation in Israel. I believe I'm, I'm the only leader of uh, any political party in Israel that actually built a business, ran a business as CEO for many years, an American business. So I know what Israel needs to do. We just need to cut through the bureaucracy, reduce taxes, get businesses uh, uh, sprouting, and that will recreate the 1 million jobs that we lost. That's the only way. Not that people in Israel sometimes think the public sector will solve the problem. No way. It's only the private sector. The public sector has become huge in Israel and, and it's uh, uh, creating such a burden on those poor little SMBs, small and medium businesses that just simply are not uh, being, are, are not surviving. So I'll reverse this. Um, we're gonna strengthen our relations with the United States and the new administration. Israel should not be any more a partisan issue. Israel needs to become again a bipartisan issue. Need to prevent Iran from proceeding towards a nuclear weapon, tell the truth about the Iranian regime, and unite, unite the state of Israel internally. Uh, I'll, I'll just say uh, one last sentence before I take some questions. Uh, there's a lot of polarization in Israel and I never uh, use the tool of hate or rhetoric, uh, uh, extreme rhetoric to get votes. And you can, in Israel, you can get a, a bunch of votes if, if you're extreme. I'm a right wing guy. I'm proud of Eretz Israel. I'm not changing my values even one millimeter, but that does not mean being right wing does not mean that you're anti anyone. I, as prime minister, will provide full and equal rights to all citizens of Israel, Haredi, secular, religious, Jews, Arabs. When I was a uh, minister of education, minister of defense, minister of economy, I always, always uh, treated everyone equally. And I'll say one last thing. In my team, in Sayeret Matkal unit, that's uh, Israel's top elite reconnaissance unit, I think I'm a minority in terms of being right-wing. I'd say we're three or four right-wingers and about eight left-wingers. But my friends that think differently from me on the future of the land of Israel, these are very profound issues, they are not one gram less patriotic than I am. They love Israel just as much as I do. So I don't accept any hate and I won't use hate as a tool to gain uh, any political uh, benefit. I'll take questions at this point. Thank you, Minister Bennett, for that uh, excellent overview. We have time for just a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to just kick it off with the first one. Uh, you know, obviously, you have tremendous experience. Um, not only in business and in military, but throughout the government, you've kind of done the dream rotation of so many important ministries that you know, you're know you obviously very well uh, equipped uh, to run it. And we know from, uh, we know from uh, personal meetings with you, your charisma and your, your, your insights and your wisdom, it's all, you know, you're a complete package in so many ways, but you know, you've made a comment at the beginning about you don't elect, you know, recommend more elections and about the polarization you mentioned a few minutes ago. So I guess the question becomes, uh, how do you propose to preempt the, the fifth election? How, how do you foresee uh, forging a coalition uh, once the elections take place? Uh, th that's a very important question. Um, turns out that I'm the key person because uh, in Israel right now, there's two blocks. There's the just not BB block, and there's the just BB block, right? And I'm the only leader of a political party who 
belongs to a third block, just Israel. The just Bibi block is the Haredim, the ultra Orthodox, the Likud, and Smotrich. The just not Bibi block is uh, Lapid, uh, Meretz, the Arab parties, uh, Gidon Sar, who have all committed, uh, Yvette Lieberman committed that under no circumstances will they sit with Bibi. And here's my stance. Um, I think Bibi served Israel well. He did a lot of good for the Jewish people in the state of Israel. He's been in power on and off for the better of tw 24 years. I think it's time to say thank you and goodbye and to move to the next generation. Uh, in the past, I supported Netanyahu. I no longer support Netanyahu, not because he's a bad guy, because he's a good guy, he's not a bad guy, but because I, the, the past year and a half has persuaded me that he will not be able to get Israel out of this chaos. And I'm convinced that I'll do a much better job in uniting Israel, in tackling uh, COVID, and in um, creating those million jobs that we need to create. Therefore, I'm uh, approaching the public and, and telling them this. But this unique position where, you know, in all the polls, they show a, a pie chart, the just not BB block and the just BB block and then Bennett. The fact that I'm not in any of those blocks gives me unique power to force, to force building a, a sustainable and good and uh, um, competent government that will take us out of this chaos. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how, to, because Israeli politics is complicated, but that's my job. I'm just going to take everyone, and because if everyone meets their commitments to boycott each other, right? So you've got Lapid, who boycotts the Haredim, who boycott Yvette, who boycotts Bibi. And I'm the only one who doesn't boycott anyone. I'm not willing to say, I will not sit, I'll sit with every party that's a, that supports a Jewish and democratic state and understands that the next few years are not about uh, uh, internal rife and fighting about this or that. It's about uniting the country, beating Corona, and restoring our economy while taking care of the rest of the issues. And, and I am committed to creating that government at all prices. Thank you. Uh, we have only a couple minutes remaining, so I'm gonna to turn to Malcolm Holmline. Malcolm? Uh, thank you, Mr. Bennett. It's good to see you. Um, could, there are two voters that I would like you to comment on. One is the Palestinian voters. What do you think the outcome of the election in the PA and how that will impact uh, Israel? And second, are you concerned about voter alienation that after four elections, and they're already joking about a fifth, that you lose the young people especially and turn people off to the democratic process? So regarding the uh, Palestinian Authority, first of all, it's yet to be seen whether, in fact, they will uh, follow through on, on elections. Um, I'll just point out the only democratic elections that were uh, that happened that took place in the PA, I believe, in 2007, there was a full majority for Hamas. Uh, if if I recall correctly, out of I think 150 or so uh, 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 seats on, on the, the, the uh, parliament, I believe 76 were Hamas and 48 were uh, Fatah. So that was sort of the worst case, which realized itself, but it didn't have tremendous meaning. It's a mess. Uh, it's clear that these folks don't, don't uh, don't have the will, desire, or ability right now to, to create a, a functioning uh, uh, system, but we're gonna muddle through it as best as we can together. Um, you know my policy, my policy is uh, dignity and uh, improving quality of life for everyone, reducing friction as much as possible, and keeping the land of Israel uh, whole. Uh, regarding the second question, Malcolm, and, and I have to say, 
I, I'm waiting for the day where we can see each other and perhaps even uh, shake each other's hand or even hug each other. Uh, hopefully uh, this year in Jerusalem. Um, well, the younger generation doesn't understand what the heck's going on here. It, it, it's, uh, it's the first time that it's very difficult for me to explain to my own children what's going on. What's going on? The degree of incompetence the degree of politicization in the government is unprecedented. And these elections are not about Palestinian state or not Palestinian state, not about religion and state. There's only one question that millions of Israelis are going to ask themselves. Since Bibi has failed, who is the most competent person to lead Israel in this time of crisis? Who has the defense background, the military background, the crisis management experience in COVID, the entrepreneurial background? Uh, well, that, that was quite a preparation for the answer. Uh, my case is that I'm the guy. Um, and never, you know, it's, it's the first time I'm running uh, for prime minister, because in the past I did think that Netanyahu was the right guy while we did have our disagreements, no longer. I think uh, uh, we have to figure out a way to part from uh, Bibi in a very honorable way, in a respectful way. Uh, he has become a symbol of, of the Jewish state and no one wants to see uh, uh, bad pictures, but it needs to happen out of respect. So my message uh, to the Israeli public is thank you, Bibi. It's been a time now. I wanna thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to be with us today, Minister Bennett, and thank you for being a, a unifying voice. And uh, we, we wish you well. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.